Greetings, everyone. So grateful you can make it here today. My name is Cameron Payne. Thank you for joining us here at We Are the Medicine, hosted by Sea Healing, an Asheville, North Carolina based nonprofit working to reduce drug overdoses and deaths of despair associated with the loneliness epidemic. We invite you to make a donation to our organization by texting Sea Healing to 44321 or using the donate button on our event page. Your donation will be used to fund our extra care program, which is using methods of authentic human connection this festival is showcasing. Um, and now we have Dr. Susan Campbell coming to us from across the country in California to talk about emotional triggering, how to and shift its trajectory and how to resolve the effects to regain composure and de-escalate challenging emotional states. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Campbell. Thanks, Cameron. And first, I want to acknowledge the Seeking Healing team for all the good work you guys have done to put this thing together. So I really hope that this will be good for you in being able to get a lot of donations for a very important cause. So, you know, my vision of the world is that we're one big healing community. And I think those of us who are joining calls like this really probably have that feeling already that community is, an, is one of the main vehicles for healing, community and connection. And I was just thinking uh, yesterday when I was swimming, how satisfying it is to be part of a we that works and how much pain the world is perhaps in, I know I am in some ways, and this is not just about some of the current breakdowns or current crises, you know, even like the climate crises or the COVID crises, but you know, there's some of our decision processes in trying to become a we. We're, we're, we're falling down on the job in some ways, but there's some ways like with, with the protests about Black Lives Matter right now, there's, there's something satisfying about becoming a we, a worldwide we, that actually is functioning well. So I know we as humanity have a long way to go, but I'm, I'm just holding that vision of the world as healing community. So thanks so much for all of you who are joining this. And one of the biggest ways that the need for healing shows up and I think it's showing up more and more in our personal life and our collective life are these things that we call emotional triggers. And I'll just say a little bit first about how I'm defining emotional triggers. And then I'm going to guide you guys in some activities to help you begin to get to know yourself better through understanding your own triggers. So quick definition. I'm not going to go into all the brain science today, but many of you already know that the trigger mechanism is part of an animal's instinctual survival mechanism. So we don't choose to be triggered. Uh, if my partner is doing something that triggers me and I, and I, attribute things like choice to my partner, like my partner's trying to do this to me. Why doesn't my partner know that I have PTSD and I can't stand a loud tone of voice? Why doesn't my partner remember this? Well, triggers are so quick and so unconscious that none of us choose to behave the way that we sometimes behave when we're triggered. But what it basically means is there's some kind of a quick response in the nervous system that is protective. It's saying in some ways, this is not safe, although it doesn't take the time to think this through. You're just instinctively reacting from some sense that you're not safe right now. And usually the stimulus for a trigger has something to do with connecting to something in your past that has left you feeling particularly vulnerable around a certain thing. So if you were criticized a lot as a youngster or anyway, anywhere up in your development, could be a previous marriage, but 
Yes. Triggers can originate at any time in your life. It's not just about childhood. And triggers can be based on serious threats to survival, or they can be what most people call developmental traumas, which are things like neglect. Just my needs didn't seem to matter. So you know, one scenario in a, a younger person's life is somebody being critical, and so you're very sensitive to certain tones of voice or certain words that suggest the other person is criticizing you. But if you were neglected a lot as a child, then you might be very sensitive to when a person's not paying attention to you. Like in a group, you say something and nobody responds. And then somebody else says almost the same thing. <laughs> you ever had this situation? And God, everybody's giving them all, all kinds of kudos for what they just said. And you're feeling kind of invisible. That's a trigger. So these are just some words of definition and now I want to go to a little cartoon. So I, I'm going to do a screen share and I'll take a minute to get there. And this gives you a little more insight into the whole territory of triggers. So here's a guy at the florist buying some flowers and the caption is, I need something that says, I'm sorry about that thing I said that caused you to totally overreact. Okay, so a lot of us probably are more sophisticated than this man. We know that calling somebody else's reaction an overreaction is simply, I'm triggered too. See, if you're judging somebody else as having an overreaction, that actually is a tender place in you that I'm trying to help everyone understand that anytime you have like resistance to a partner's reaction or judgment about a partner's reaction, you yourself are triggered. Some of us are gonna have to learn, some of us have been through relationships where we tend to see it as the other person's problems. If, you know, if there's a, if there's a trigger, it's, no, it's not usually the other person's trigger, not my own. And there are certain dynamics that will lead you into that kind of a relationship. And I'll be speaking about those later. And I'm gonna stop this screen share now, but I just wanna say this is a very popular view of triggers is that some, somebody is overreacting and I'm in relationship to them and I'm just trying to keep the peace. So very often opposites will attract in relationships. So I may be a very toned down reasonable person and I may be attracted to someone who's a little more fiery. So there's always gonna be two different styles kind of misinterpreting things like tone of voice. Maybe the person who's trying to get the other person to quiet down has kind of a flat tone of voice and that will trigger the more fiery person who's used to a little, a little more connectivity through energetic exchanges, not this flat type exchange. So the, the more fiery person might feel, I'm not important, I'm not being heard, there's a disconnect here. And what I wanna say is triggers nowadays are not about survival. I think we kind of know this. They're almost always, adult triggers are almost always about a threat to connection with someone that we are very wanting to be connected to somebody who's important to us, a significant other or our parent or our child or even our boss, but somebody that we value the connection and there's been some disruption in connection. So it's really more of, a, of an emotional thing 
And remember, most of these triggers, not all, some triggers were based on real threats to survival, like if you grew up in a war zone or something like that. But the origin of most of our triggers is some kind of unmet need, whether it's an unmet childhood need, and that's, that's where most of them originate from. Like that need to feel valued, to feel like when we're all sitting around the dinner table, my voice gets heard. And how many of us weren't listened to as children. So we have some kind of sensitivity around that. And one of the things I want to accomplish today with us is learning a little more about what some of our core fears are, which indicate that some of our core, possibly core childhood needs were not fully met. And so you get triggered in an adult relationship and that same core fear gets triggered, like my voice doesn't matter, I'm not important to this person. Because a, a trigger in my world is a fear based on some unfinished attempt to get your need met. So let, let's say that um, I'm feeling like not heard in the situation. That would be my core fear, that my voice doesn't matter. The core need, it's obvious to see what the core need is, is to feel important, to feel significant to feel that I matter. So I'm gonna do another screenshot now that shows some of the core fears and we can indicate as we talk through these, what's the core need underneath this core fear? But I bet you, you guys are gonna recognize yourself in this list of core fears. Here comes another screenshot. Now I'm going to scroll this up. So I'm just, this is just a list of core fears and I'm going to scroll it through here and we'll go through it together. So usually when core fears come up in an adult relationship, this is an opportunity to explore a little bit more into, okay, if I feel into what I feel when I'm triggered and I'll be guiding you in an activity later on where we pick one of our triggers and then explore it. But I think I want to just get some common language first here. So if I feel into what I'm feeling when I have this fear, that's the exploration that I think is the first step in healing triggers. Well, the very first step is admitting that you have them and admitting that it's not just your partner's fault that upsets happen in your relationship. So I am talking mainly about triggers in the context of a partnership of some significance right now. That's a, just a good metaphor for any situation where we get something triggered because it's almost always about somebody else letting us down, not meeting our needs, scaring us in some way. So here, we're gonna look at the way fears show up in most humans. So one of the most common fears is the fear of abandonment. And so that is indicated if you're pretty, what, pretty much tuned in to people moving away from you. When your partner's on a trip or something, there's, there's a little bit of insecurity that will come up or a lot, depending on the, the state you're in about what's going on. Am I, am I out of sight, out of mind here? So that, that, that fear that the other person is somehow moving away from you. So just notice, do you identify with that fear? Do you, can you own that that's one of yours? Another common one, I don't have the whole list of all the possible core fears, but these are the main ones that I run into in working with people. Then there's a fear of being controlled. And that might come from early experiences where you weren't trusted and you weren't given a lot of space to try things out by yourself. 
And children need freedom to trial and error their way through certain problems. But somebody was always hovering over you, that sort of thing, or asking you a lot of questions. So let's say you're now in an adult relationship and your partner asks you a lot of questions. Where did you go? Oh, what did you guys talk about? That might have you start to feel controlled. Okay, so we'll come back to these in a little while and look at what, what might be the core need underneath some of these. And then the fear of rejection. That's a hugely common one. Um, I wrote this book, Truth in Dating, and uh, for a long while in my professional career, I was doing a lot of dating seminars. And the biggest fear that people have, and this is not news to most of you, in the dating world, the biggest fear is fear of rejection. And the second biggest fear is fear of having to say no to somebody and have them perhaps feel rejected. So I think we can, we can all feel both sides of that one. And then there's fear of criticism. I mentioned this in my early comments where you're very sensitive to somebody indicating that you're not like perfect or you did something wrong or you made a mistake. And so you'll quickly get on the defense if somebody's, you know, like at work, that's a, that's a tough one at work or on a work team where we're supposed to be getting a task done and we're critiquing each other's work. And it can be pretty tough if you have a fear of criticism there. And, but once we own what our core fears are, we can actually, like at work, for example, educate other people to what our sensitivities are. And sometimes other people might remember what our sensitivities are. But to expect that, to ever expect that, I told you that loud voices destabilize me, why can't you remember that? Like in a married couple, and you would think a married couple would care about creating safety for each other. But to expect that another person is gonna be able to remember and actually behave according to a conscious conversation that you've had in the past or even several, that expectation is gonna have you getting triggered a lot more than you need to be because people aren't naturally wired up the same as their partner. Once in a great while, you are kind of wired up with the same personality style, but it seems like on the planet today, there's a lot of couples or partnerships where people are very different personality styles. And gee, the things that I think to do that I think would be nice and supportive to you are not even the things that feel supportive to you. Because you know, I'm operating from my personality style world and you're operating from yours. So learning about triggers is one of the biggest first steps in learning how to not take those differences as something intentional, some in intentionally ignoring me, but to more work with my reaction to feeling like, why couldn't he remember this? And then feeling like maybe my needs don't matter, that sort of thing. Taking that fear story, because that's what I like to call it, my needs don't matter is like a fear story that pops into my mind when I'm hurting like that. It's a little bit part of the whole trigger reaction. So taking, taking that story and feeling what the feelings are underneath that. And instead of thinking, I shouldn't have to be in the situation to feel these feelings, because that's the big resistance that most of us have. And that's why we tend to blame and and like the man in the florist shop want to project it onto the partner. That's what, we just don't want to fully feel my own pain around this. Is just That's just what's going to get triggered when certain things happen in my life. And if I can own that I have this sensitivity, and that's what we're doing in this exercise. Some of us have more of a sensitivity to being controlled. 
some of us don't have much of a sensitivity at all to being controlled. We're more afraid of being abandoned or rejected. You know, in other words, some people are more afraid of somebody coming too close, and getting in my business. Other people, boy, get, get in my business more. That makes me feel loved. So I'm just trying to legitimize that there are very different personality styles and humanity as a whole is trying to learn how to embrace and work with our differences. And, and I think dyad relationships are probably one of the best but most intense learning laboratories for really getting to understand that these differences are just part of what is and the triggers that come from these differences are part of me getting to connect with my childhood unfinished business, my childhood developmental wounds where some of my core developmental needs were not met. Because, you know, parents are very busy. Even the best of parents, they are going to not have you dialed in. Maybe you, you were born to people who had different personality style than you. So they're not dialed in to, to your needs. That can have you feeling very alone. Or parents, like I said, are just busy, distracted. They have their own problems. And of course, we have the disorganized families where it didn't even feel safe to be in that family. There was addiction. There was violence. There was something that had you not even feeling safe. So of course, the needs for safety, protection, being loved, being honored, being seen, being given a certain amount of freedom. These are the core needs that every human, if they had these, they would grow up to just be healthy and blossoming. But most of us have something that didn't happen for us. So we're kind of limping along. We're really good in some areas, but we've got some, some of these core fears and things that we've got to slow down and attend to these because when we slow down and attend to them we really can heal them so just a couple more here that some of you might identify with fear of being inadequate fear of being a failure this is more like the fear of not being good enough and it's this extremely common one uh, so people who are afraid of not being good enough their reaction to a, a triggering behavior will often be some kind of defensiveness or explaining, trying to let the other person know, no, I didn't, I didn't mean for you to have that reaction. Here's why I did that. And you might think you're being reassuring when your partner's triggered and you try to talk to them like that. But when people are triggered, they really can't take in that kind of reasonable explanation, usually. Of course, it depends on how deeply they're triggered, how long standing that wound is, how much they've already done some work to get familiar with that wound. But for most of us, I think we're better off just not trying to defend when there's a trigger, but going, oh, I noticed myself getting defensive. It's my fear of not being good enough, getting activated here. Now, how many people have that language yet? It's coming. And just the fact that I'm going down this list right now, and probably most of you can recognize that you do own that you have at least one of these core fears. And I've been working with this material for probably 40 years. I've, I've been a, a psychologist in private practice for 55 years, but I became aware of triggers in uh, one of my marriages and became, began to really study that. And it's been over 40 years that I've been a student of triggers. And when I used to go into an audience and ask people about how many people have fear of abandonment, you know, people didn't even know what I was really talking about. Now I can ask people this list of triggers. You know, how many people have this fear? How many people have that fear? And people easily get into the exercise. People are raising their hand. They're raising their hand more than once. And it's kind of a good 
catharsis. Everybody realizes, gee, I'm not the only one that has this. And it's, it's definitely a cultural development since I first started working in this area. So good on us. So now I'll just take this last one, fear of being trapped, which is not the most common. The others that I've mentioned are much more common, but some people do have a history where they were smothered and actually, you know, actually not allowed much freedom at all. Or maybe they were, maybe it's a little bit related to somebody criticizing them or controlling them. So what their fear is, it could be a combination of being controlled or being trapped. But if somebody gets too close, they kind of lose themselves. They give away their power to other people. So this would be the kind of person who would perhaps shy away from close relationships because you just can't hold, hold your own ground. But this is simply, you know, starting out with any of these fears, it's simply a way to begin to have a little more tenderness and compassion to some of your own inner workings. So let's just, so if I'm gonna look at, if somebody has a fear of criticism, what might the core need be there? You can just, I'm just gonna guess and you can just guess to yourself. Well, my need is to like not be criticized. Okay, not be criticized. Oh, to be appreciated, to be acknowledged that kind of thing, to be valued. Or if my, f my fear is of abandonment, I want to know that you love me, that you wanna be close to me, you wanna be in my presence. And maybe some of us had a lot of that when we were children, you're such a good kid, I like hanging out with you, but so many of us, like I said, parents are busy or they have their own needs. They haven't even learned how to meet their own needs. And one of the things that happens, and I'm gonna stop the screen share now. One of the things that happens in families is sure, our parents aren't always able to meet their own needs and they don't always feel perfectly adequate in the parent role. And, and many of you are parents and you know what a challenge that can be. But as kids, let's just go back to the kid position for a minute. We are little, we've all been in this experience of being little in a world of big people and we're very, very vigilant and attuned to what's okay with the big people and what's not okay with the big people. And very often when we're crying or when we're inconsolable, when we're upset, when we're making noise about our needs, this can make the big people uncomfortable. It can make them feel their fear of being inadequate. Geez, I'm not a good parent. My, my kid just keeps crying. That is something that the little kid picks up and Bet you almost all of us had some instances where big people were uncomfortable with our expressions of pain or need. And if I'm this little person and I'm kind of picking up what's going to be safe and approved of in this world now and what's not safe and approved of, one of the things I might come away with, one conclusion is if I'm in pain, there's something wrong with me or it makes somebody else uncomfortable. So I think we're all right now at this stage of human evolution needing to accept that there is a certain amount of unfelt emotional pain in all of us. It just got stuffed down and now we've got this little well of unfelt feelings because we had to cut certain things off. And certainly if you were truly traumatized and you know somebody locked you you know locked you in your room for hours just because you were crying well that's one thing 
but even just the normal little uncomfortableness of the parent or when you're a tiny person you're crying and you you got scared by something and you want your parent to pick you up and hold you and say honey it's safe that was you know, that was an explosion over in the neighborhood there but we're safe a lot of times the parent doesn't do that the parent will stick a pacifier in the child or something like in the child's mouth or give them a toy or something and that leaves the kid alone with their fear so the adult work of healing our triggers and they can be healed as an adult whether it's with yourself and redoing your relationship with yourself and bringing in more of the good mother archetype and as i said i'm going to be doing an exercise on this in a few minutes helping you learn to be with yourself in a healing way and then the other way we get healing is by going to our partner and saying when this happened it triggered this old fear that i'm not important to you and i need to feel like i matter i need your help here so that's the kind of conversation and the kind of new healing relationships that I'm, I'm hoping we're all going to be picking up from this program and from some of the books I've written and from a lot of other good work out there because this is now a theme in our culture. So I want to look now at the parts of your own reactive cycle because this, this will give you tremendous power to pause and do some inner self-nurturing or pause and ask for something that's going to be of a reassuring nature from your partner if we know the early warning signs of when we're triggered so the early warning signs have certain elements to them i'll just bring this slide up So one element of knowing that you're triggered is your body sensations. So that's down in these, these, these two people, body sensations, not in the belly, heavy chest. Those are two of the body sensations that are very, very common and often between these sort of two different personality types. One person who's got more of a fear of not being good enough and the other person has more of a fear of not being loved or attended to. So that's, that's a common opposites attract kind of dynamic that I see in couples. So let's just take a glance at this screenshot just so we can see the elements here. We've got a body, somebody says something. So think of a situation where you got triggered. Somebody says something or does something or they fail to do something and that disappoints you. So when I say got triggered, I just, you don't have to go into a huge reaction. When I say triggered, I just mean you have some lack of safety signaling that's going on in your nervous system. And then you'll do certain protective things. Like for some people, the protective things would be to shut down or get quiet. For other people, the protective things would be more like appeasing and agreeing and smiling and nodding. So you can be smiling and nodding and be triggered. For some people, it's more obvious. You you're yell, you blow up, or you start asking a lot of questions, making suggestions to the other person. See, a lot of us, you know, we think we're making helpful suggestions. Like I, I was uh, talking to somebody and the woman was uh, telling me how the man didn't seem to have time for her. And so she says to him, you know, so her, she, her fear of not being important or a fear of abandonment, one of those was getting triggered, but she didn't own it as hers. So she's triggered and she says to him, we need to get you to a time management course. Does that sound like somebody who's triggered? 
well, I want to broaden your definition of what it looks like when somebody's triggered. Yeah, that is somebody who's triggered. Helpful suggestions, judgmental thoughts, not just judgmental behavior. Like, why didn't this person do this? They could have just done it that way. That's a common internal judgment that indicates that you're triggered. So you're going to have different protective behaviors and protective emotions coming up. And then you're going to have protective stories. Like I said, some of the judgmental thoughts, like why didn't that person, that sort of thing. But under the harsher judgmental thoughts, there's usually some kind of a self-doubt kind of a thought. Like if I'm outwardly protecting myself by saying, we got to get you a time management course. If I were to really feel deeper into what I'm feeling right there, I'm feeling the fear that that person doesn't want to spend time with me. The fear that I'm not important or loved. So every single one of these reactions that we're seeing here, because these are all different kinds of protective reactions that ordinary, fairly healthy people get into. Stories that are judgmental are covering over the kind of stories that you see here on the screenshot, like the deeper, more vulnerable story, I don't matter, I'm all alone. And even those are deeper, those are deeper and more vulnerable. They're not true, but it gives you an insight into something that is true, which is an unmet need that's still hanging around in your subconscious, waiting to be triggered in an adult relationship so you can attend to it the way maybe your actual parent when you were a child could never attend to it. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this screenshot off and I'm gonna guide us to reflect on one of our own triggers and see what we can learn about that. So can you think of a time, this might take a minute to access, a time in an adult relationship where you had some kind of a trigger reaction, one of those core fears got triggered. So see if you, it might help to close your eyes to do this. May or may not, but um, what I want you to do is take, take enough time to get to that. And I'm just gonna keep going. Some of us will already have found that trigger incident. So we'll call that the trigger triggering incident. Somebody said something to me that I didn't like. So what was my reactive behavior? What did I actually do? Did I go into a bit of a fight energy where I started to argue? Did I go into more of a flight kind of movement? where I tried to like talk themselves, talk them, I mean, talk them out of what they were feeling, reason. Did I go into more of a freeze reaction where I kind of went blank, got into a shock, got confused? Maybe none of the above, but those are the typical tendencies that the nervous system will follow one of those kinds of things. There's, there's also a couple other versions of the freeze mode. Some people call it fawning, which would be like the pleaser and well, faking agreement with the person. Yes, yes, dear. Yeah, you're right. But it's, it's just another form of freeze. And then there's the folding, which is sort of like completely feeling hopeless and helpless and just kind of, I give up. And sometimes your posture will go almost into a fold down contraction in your uh, solar plexus area. So just thinking about that incident, bringing it back to mind. 
and being a little gentle with yourself when you bring back these memories. I don't want you to bring back something that's like horribly scary and intense for a short workshop like this. But if, if it starts to feel intense at any time, open your eyes, look around, actually name what you see in the room. Like I see a picture with a brown frame or feel your butt on the chair that you're sitting on. These are all important self-management techniques that we can use to modify the intensity if, if any feelings ever get too charged. So we're first just remembering a situation and we're noting what was the behavior I did. I yelled, I walked out, I faked agreement. No. So just kind of name that. It might even be worthwhile to, to jot some notes down if, the, if this is the kind of thing you like to do. Then what did I feel? Was there a feeling? You know, an emotional type feeling like anger or hurt feelings. And what about body sensations? Did I feel that knot in my throat, almost like I can't breathe or I can't speak? Did I feel my fists starting to clench? Just what body sensations came up? Now, not all of us are good at sensing the body. Some of us sense the body right away. That's the first thing we notice when we're triggered. And just know who you are because whatever your easiest indicator is to notice, these are the early warning signs that you're triggered. And they're usually kind of similar for all your different triggers. Or there may be two patterns of triggering, but there, are, there usually is kind of one or two that you're working at any particular uh, stage in your life. But most of us are working the same one our whole lifetime. So some of us notice stories first. So what's the reactive story that comes up? The reactive story like, oh my God, nobody cares what I have to say. It could be a fear story, it could be an anger story, but it's still got a fear element to it. There's some genuine need that you fear is not being met, just like was true at some earlier stage in your life. So basically, those four things, noticing body sensations, emotional type feelings, reactive stories like geez i can never get it right with this person or i way down on the list with this person i can't seem to you know, even get heard now those would be reactive stories but you can tell there's a lot of vulnerability right under the anger feeling to these stories there's i want to be important i want to be wanted i want to be loved so I've mentioned there's body sensations, emotion type feelings, stories, and then there's your actual behavior. You tend to walk out, get more aggressive, completely space out like deer in the headlights. So any of those kinds of things, those four, if you know what your tendencies are, like those in those four areas, that's kind of like a little checklist and you're going to be better prepared to notice quicker when you are being triggered. So you, having a little language sometimes helps you notice things. That's why I'm using these terms. So now the real work begins once you can admit that you do have these kind of trigger reactions sometimes. And hopefully you can begin to understand that almost all of us have these kinds of 
triggers, we have unfinished business from our childhood, we have unmet needs that we're still kind of going around watching for that, oh, that one's, once again, I'm not getting that, you know, that kind of condition, how we perceive the world, what we're scanning for. I think it's getting to be common knowledge, especially in a group like this, that triggers are kind of normal. But still, there's a lot of shame about triggers. I, I work with pretty sophisticated clients, and you can still see that it's just so hard. Oh, gee, why can't I get over this trigger? I've been working on myself for 15 years, and the same trigger still comes up. It's, uh, sometimes it's worse, that type of thing. Whatever shows up, it's the work. That's the work. And to me, Triggers are an opportunity like no other, using trigger reactions like no other opportunity to pause and deeply explore and perhaps have a chance to really bring healing to disown fragmented parts of yourself, parts of yourself that you may not even have wanted to know about, maybe because they just made you feel too weak, too needy, that sort of thing. So if you have issues about not being right, not looking good, uh, being weak, being needy, which I'm sure most of us have had some kind of issues about that at some point in our lives, to the extent that we have resistance to owning weakness, fear, deficits, that sort of thing, we're gonna have a little shame still to, to get through. But that does not prevent us from beginning the work. But I'm, I'm hoping and praying for the day that most of us take it a little more in stride that, yeah, I do have these sensitivities. Having these sensitivities does reveal that I'm not completely whole and perfect, but I'm still lovable. I'm still an adequate human being. Like you don't have to be any certain way to be an adequate human being. This is, we, we, we really are needing to, um, I think the whole authentic relating movement is we're trying to redefine what it means to be an adequate human being. All you need to be adequate is to be your authentic self. That makes it so much easier. That was the message of my book, Getting Real. It's like, there's, there's, there's no way that you're not in control if you're not trying to control how you come across, if you're just willing to reveal what's there. So that's the work of triggers is sort of a, a real deep challenge around that because there is so much shame about you know, being uh, damaged, flawed, that sort of thing. So we start by admitting, yeah, I do have some fear and some maybe shyness at least about revealing these things. But today we're just gonna be revealing them within ourselves. So you've identified a situation. So now I'm going to do a guided self-inquiry, starting with that trigger situation in an adult relationship. And I'm gonna guide you through what I call the compassionate self-inquiry process. And, and this practice is written out just pretty much the way I'm gonna be guiding you. It's written out in the book, Five Minute Relationship Repair. So find a way to be in this chair that you're sitting in that feels comfortable and supportive. Just let your weight kind of start to drop into the chair. And it probably will help to close your eyes now if you haven't done that already. And allow your breathing to become a little more slow and deliberate. This is simply an act of self-calming. It's kind of like reassuring yourself that you're safe here.
And now bring back the image, the memory of that time that you picked in an adult relationship. We're not going back to childhood here. And just picture yourself in the scene with this other person, what the other person did or said, and how you felt both in your body sensations and your emotions. And just continue to breathe as you bring these memories back. And now we're going to focus particularly on what the experience was inside of you. The feelings, the sensations first, and just give some space to experiencing those a little bit as you continue to breathe and expand your awareness so that it's big enough to hold space for some tender memories here, some things that probably aren't pleasant. And imagine that as you breathe, you are making more space inside yourself. It's like an act of self-support. There's room for these feelings and sensations, and I will hold you. I, this big, spacious, breathing space. There's like a presence of awareness that begins to build as you voluntarily remember certain things, while at the same time, voluntarily breathe more fully and deeply. You're building your capacity to hold space for yourself here. So it's almost like there's two angles that are in your awareness at once. There's the angle of I'm feeling how I felt in this memory of being triggered. And I'm witnessing with a kind of soft, gentle spaciousness. And I do think of it sometimes as activating the good mother archetype. That all accepting presence that is actually in all of us, no matter what kind of parenting you had, we all have inside of us that part of us that knows how to empathize and that knows what feels good, what we need, what we need from a parent figure. So just kind of trust in this natural gift that nature and being human gives us. As you continue to feel into now, what were some of those body sensations, feelings, or what was a story? that came up. So we also holding space for any thoughts, like fear thoughts that might be there. And just notice how this might change or how it might actually feel a little heavier or a little lighter as you continue to breathe and shine the light of awareness on this. Notice anything else that comes in, any, any other associations, like it's sort of like, it's sort of like something, it might remind you of something else, or it might be sort of like something in some metaphorical way, like it's sort of like somebody just put their hand over my mouth and won't let me talk, or just sort of like something. Just feel into whatever images come.
and then there might be memories or things that have felt similar. Just allow any of this to come if it, if it naturally comes. Like whatever this feeling is in this adult interaction, it's starting to feel a little familiar. I've maybe been here before in some similar way. I can't quite necessarily remember a specific. Or maybe you can. Maybe, maybe a memory pops completely into your mind right now. And if that happens, this is a gift for further healing. And imagine yourself as that little person, if it does bring up a memory. Imagine yourself. Or perhaps there is no memory, but there's kind of an intuition that some, sometime have some vague recollection or some intuition that sometime I was feeling something similar. So I want you to hold, hold in your embrace this younger version of yourself or this tender feeling that you're having as if this is a much loved child that you care for very much. You just hold this child in your embrace as if you're saying, it's okay. It's okay to feel whatever you're feeling. I'm here with you. So you're sort of building a new relationship with yourself here. And allow yourself to just be like this with yourself for a little bit, taking a few more slow, deliberate breaths, expanding the space inside of yourself to hold a little more feeling. Sometimes it feels good to put your hand somewhere on your body or to hug yourself a little bit, just as a gesture of softening toward that part of yourself. And so be with this for just another few seconds. And we're going to bring this to a close. We're just getting ready to bring this to a close but really anchoring in possibly with a, a, a feeling inside your body or by touching your body in some place, you're kind of anchoring in being there for yourself when you're hurting. You kind of like Again, no big reassurance that everything is going to be changed or different, but more like you're okay with this feeling. It's easy to understand that you would have this. You're okay when you're in pain. So you're anchoring in a kind of loving presence towards yourself. Take a few more deep breaths and then we'll open our eyes and just look around and possibly shake your body a little bit here. Stretch. Mm. Now you can do this activity for yourself whenever you find yourself after a triggering event in a safe place where you can do this for yourself. And once you've done this, then you're ready to go back and talk to the person that you got into a trigger reaction with, if that's needed and if it's appropriate. And you will reveal to them that this fear got triggered. And what I need more than anything is some reassurance that this fear is not currently true. Like, I'm afraid I'm not important. I need your help feeling that I am important. 
that type of thing. And that's basically going to set you up for a really good repair if you've truly owned the pain as yours. You're not blaming your partner anymore. You're in a soft place towards yourself. So you're going to be in a much more spacious, available place to listen to whatever your partner has to say. Now, ideally, both partners are doing this practice and both partners have done this self-inquiry before coming back to talk about it. Um, but even if you don't have a partner who's able to do that, or if you don't have a partner at all, this is the core of the inner work that's available to all of us. It's the gift of our getting triggered. So I'm gonna close up this presentation now and I just wanna thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for joining us, everyone. Please consider making a donation to Seek Healing so that the offerings like you just experienced can be shared with those who need this medicine. If you have questions, you can reach out to info at seekhealing.org or check the event page to reach out to our fantastic facilitators or make a bid on our local love auction items. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Campbell.